greenhouse media or greenhouse, the rhizosphere where we grow our plants. And a couple of things you need to remember about what's required to grow plants. And we use the word root substrate. And the reason why I use the word root substrate is because depending on what your production practices are, you could be using soil, potting soil, potting soil mixed with field soil, hydroponic substrates, water, aeroponics, all kinds of different things. So I want to talk about root substrates. Some people use the word medium. Media is plural, medium. We use, you see that in the literature a lot. To separate out from soil, and usually the word soil, when we talk about soil, it re we're actually referring to the actual soil that we found in the ground. So there are four things that we have to have for a root substrate to function to support plant growth. The first thing that the root substrate needs to do is to provide a reservoir for your plant nutrients. And that reservoir for the plant nutrients, the nutrients have to be available to the plant. And it has to be a reservoir for water, water that's available to the plant. It needs to have air exchange, it needs to have air. We need to have oxygen in the root system. Roots require oxygen to grow, oxygen to metabolize, oxygen to take up nutrients, and to take up water and to support the plant. So if we're not providing any oxygen, we're providing, we're going to suffocate our plants. And finally, it needs to provide anchorage or support for the plant, because plants are terrestrial in nature. And when you're thinking about different kinds of media or different kinds of soil, in your soils class you talk about sand, silt, and clay. And that's about all they talk about. except for maybe a little bit of organic matter. Sand is um, good, gives good root support, supports the plant, but sand basically has no cation exchange capacity, doesn't hold water, so it doesn't hold nutrients, and it's not necessarily a good substrate. Clay, which is a finer textured soil structure, has a high cation exchange because it's got greater surface area because it's a smaller, a smaller substrate. It has the capacity to hold a lot of water, but yet, in fact, it doesn't have any airspace or very little airspace, so plants have a tendency to suffocate. So it's important that we find a, a good balance between the two. In greenhouse production, oftentimes we use water as a substrate. Now, water, of course, is going to provide water. And we can put our nutrients in the water. And we can even supply gas exchange by bubbling water, uh, bubbling air into it or something like that. You can provide plenty of oxygen by just aerating the water. But yet, water provides no physical support, so no anchorage. So we would have to do um, add some kind of an anchorage or a trellising system to support if we're using just water. Field soils, native soil, natural soil, putting it in a pot, gives us excellent support, high nutrient ha water holding capacity, but poor gas exchange. A lot of times when I talk to gardeners or people bringing houseplants in, I say, what kind of potting soil are you using? Well, I have excellent garden soil in the backyard. I've just brought that in, but my plants are dying. Well, the plants are suffocating because we can't take, I, I try to say, picture the size of the pot outside. And she says there's no pot outside. Yes, there's a pot outside. It's called the whole earth. When you take and subject that to a small little bitty container, you're changing things a lot. So you have poor gas exchange. Another really important part, a lot of our potting soils that we use, potting media, pot, root, root zone substrates that we use, and I use all the words interchangeable, <laughs> is that they're organic. And we use a lot of organic material. So we want to make sure that the organic material that we're using in our potting soil is stable. Now what that means is we don't want it to shrink in size. How many of you ever had a compost bin? And when you turn your compost bin, what happens to the volume? 
reduces almost probably if you're doing it right about half. So imagine if you've got fresh compost in your potting soil by the end of your production cycle you've lost half the volume of your soil. So you need to have some organic matter that's stable. And of course the smaller the particle size equals finer texture. Finer texture is uh, smaller pores and with smaller pores you have reduced gas exchange so forth. So you want to look at how as it decomposes, it goes into smaller sizes and you lose your air exchange, you lose your volume. Things like straw and sawdust are pretty popular, pretty commonly found uh, organic substrates that you can get on a regular basis, but they are actually very poor so, um, potting soils because they're so fresh and uh, poorly decomposed at the time when you're using them that they shrink in volume and they don't have good stability. <coughs> and part of that is when we're looking at our organic matter is we use a term called carbon nitrogen ratio or the CN ratio. Now in soils class you probably work with some C, they talked a little bit about CN ratio and how much organic matter is in a traditional mineral field soil. The numbers we're going to talk about are very, very different. Organic materials are decomposed by organic, by our microorganisms in the soil. One of the things I want you to think about when you're dealing with potting soil in the greenhouse is I want you to think about what this is a rhizosphere, okay? And it's a biological organism in its entirety. There are lots of different critters in that potting soil that all work together to enhance plant growth. And of course, we hope that we have more good critters than bad critters, right? More good fungi than bad fungi. And we need to have those microorganisms to help the plants grow, just like you have to have microorganisms in your own stomach and your own body to help digest your food. So one of the things we need to do that if we have raw organic matter, the microorganisms are going to colonize and they're going to kick into gear to chew up those raw uh, organic compounds. And what they also need is a high source or high reservoir of nitrogen. And this is why we oftentimes see some people call it phytotoxic, but it's not really a phytotoxicity, where your plants turn yellow from too, or, too raw of an organic matter. They're actually just nitrogen deprived. So if you're using high CAN ratio material, you have to add more nitrogen. The best carbon nitrogen ratios that we want is 30 to 1, 30 to 1. And that means that uh, if it's greater than 31, there's organic material that can be readily decomposed and your microorganisms are going to require nitrogen and rob it from the plant. If it's less than 30 to 1, you've got a good balance. The carbon rate nitrogen ratio of sawdust, if you were to go to a sawmill and collect sawdust, if you had access to that, uh, you'll see that that's regularly 1,000 to 1. We use a lot of pine bark in potting soil. Pine bark has a carbon nitrogen ratio of 300 to 1. It's, great, it's 10 times greater than 30 to 1, but yet pine bark, we use it all the time, and it's very effective. Why would pine bark be different than sawdust? And it can be pine sawdust. Larger chunks, and Larger chunks, that's part of it. Less surface area for the microorganisms. Less, no, it's not necessarily the surface area of the microorganisms, because if we use wood chips, it would be the same as sawdust. What's different about pine bark? It's, it's, it's going to be more acidic, yes, slightly more acidic. What's the difference in wood and bark? What's the difference in wood and bark? What's that? Nutrient levels, yeah. Density. What is the, what is the carbohydrate structure of wood? One of them is cellulose and one is lignin. Pine bark is lignified where the cellulose structures are lignified with uh, saps and, and uh, different kinds of uh, uh, plant compounds, whereas the sawdust itself is raw cellulose. So the, ligni the lignification protects the bark from the um, uh, degradation of the microorganisms. So that's why pine bark works so well. Okay. 
Now, some other things we talk about when looking at good properties of media, we need to think about the bulk density. And the bulk density, for instance, the shipping companies, they think about the dry bulk temperature, dry bulk density. And that's the oven dry weight of the, of the potting soil divided by the volume and give it pounds per cubic feet. Now, we need to know that because of what it's going to cost to ship us, ship our product, OK? Also, when we talk about the dry bulk density, when we talk about the bulk density, if it's too low, if there's no bulk density, typically what happens is the potting soil dries out too quickly in between irrigations, and you have to spend too much time watering. Also, in light bulk density soils, if you're growing tall plants like foliage, palms, and such as that, you want to have enough bulk density in your potting soil so you don't have your plants tipping over in the truck, tipping over on the bench. There's nothing more annoying than having to walk through a greenhouse and stand up your plants. If the bulk density is too high, you have handling issues, cost you more freight, and you need to think about your ability of your employees to pick up and move plants at the same time. So the shipping expenses and handling expenses. The wet bulk density is the weight of your potting soil at what we call container capacity. And container capacity changes with different way your mix is put together. Container capacity is designed as or is defined as the water content of your potting soil, of your potting medium, after we've completely saturated it and then allowed it to drain, losing what we call gravitational water. In other words, letting the pot drip. And we do this as a percent volume on your container capacity. If it's too light, topples, it's hard to ship, too heavy, same thing. We typically want about 40 to 60 pounds of container capacity per cubic foot. Another important part of good quality substrates is water retention and sufficient aeration. We need to make sure we've got good, good available water with the acceptable wet and dry bulk densities and plenty of, plenty of air. Now, at uh, container capacity, we've got solid material. We've got the, the potting media itself. And we have pores that are filled with unavailable water. Unavailable water is that water that the plant cannot extract, say, less than 15 bars. You've heard that before, the permanent wilting point. So you have unavailable water and available water and air. Your root system has to have air. So when you look at this, and we call it pore space or porosity, mineral soil is about 50-50 air space and solid space. When we start blending peat moss, for instance, this next one down is, is one part mineral soil, one part peat moss, one part sand, which is probably the potting soil that we used up until the 1960s into the 70s, you can see that our airspace, which is the light blue bar, starts to get greater. We add bark to the mix, it's even greater. If you added the light blue and the dark blue together, it would be 100%. And when we add vermiculite, we could see that we're getting up into the range of 80 to 90% porosity. And this is ideal for greenhouse production of plants in a, pot, in a container. So that potting soil, that good garden soil that that person called me on the phone and asked, said, why are plants dying? You can see there's not enough airspace in the system. Unavailable water, that's that water we call hygroscopic water, less than 15 bars. And for a plant to survive that kind of condition, it has to be able to pull that kind of moisture. We don't need, you know, even a cactus doesn't like, doesn't grow well in completely xeric soil. So the available water is the water at container capacity, less the volume remaining at that. So the substrate components, it really doesn't matter what you're growing your plants in. 
really doesn't matter. It depends upon how it's been milled, how it's handled, if it's an organic material, how well it's composted, how the particle size is. The most critical thing to have in your potting soil is air space. Space. Space for the roots to grow, space for everything to happen, space for everything to work in great. Now the other thing is, is the container height is going to affect your drainage, especially when it comes to gravitational water. The smaller the container, the greater this effect is. And for a demonstration, we have a standard sponge. I probably need to get a new sponge because it's starting. And this is to show you a little bit of an example of how container capacity or container height influences it. So I'm going to take this sponge and I'm going to completely fill it, completely fill all the pore spaces with water. So it's what we call 100% saturation. Container capacity is that level, and here we have a bedding plant flat. Container capacity is the water minus the gravitational water. So if I turn this into a six inch pot that's taller than a bedding plant flat, we lose water. Now I'm not squeezing it, I promise. Now the water that comes out, the gravitational water that drops out, the water that's remaining is what we call water holding capacity. Now if I turn this six inch, this, this six inch pot into, let's say a tree tube, I lose even more. The idea behind this is that we change the level of water holding capacity. We also need to think it by the texture of the soil and the height of the soil, so they work together. So in other words, a finer textured soil has stronger capillary force will pull the potting soil up. So a taller container is going to need a finer textured soil to have a more unified balance in the system. Now something else I want you to remember too is this there's a zone of what we call a zone of saturation in the bottom of your pot. Okay? In other words, right there it's it's hundred percent saturated. Because the only way that water passes through that point is to have gravitational force pushing past that to push water out the bottom. That zone of saturation is there's no oxygen. Therefore, your roots don't grow into that zone of saturation. Anything that you do to change that zone of saturation by a finer textured mix moves it up and you decrease the volume of your, of your pot. What happens if I put gravel in the bottom of my pot? I move that up again. No gravel. Don't put gravel. Everybody says you got to have gravel for drainage. Well, if you don't have a drain hole in it, yes, you need gravel in the bottom of your pot. Or if you need to have gravel in the bottom of your pot to keep the plant standing up, but I would rather you have no gravel in the pot and have an open hole. Okay. No, rocks. no rocks. Take your rocks out. I mean, don't those rocks break down a little bit and give some nutrients? Do the rocks break down a little bit and give some nutrients? Not in your lifetime. Not in your lifetime, nor mine, nor the combined lifetime in this room. No, not even a little bit. Unless it's dirty. Using rock for what? Increase the gas exchange. Okay, it, you can use, it uh, depends on um, how the, the, what kind of rocks you're using. If you're going to just put gravel in there, no, it doesn't gonna increase your gra rock exchange. Uh, pea gravel is still, that's too rounded. You need something that's angular in structure. So typically, and even sand has a tendency to clog airspace. So, um, if hydro that's a totally different substrate. That's a ceramic hydroponic rock. That's actually a ceramic pellet that's got airspace incorporated into the manufacture. So that's a totally different product. So like um, pebbled um, pumice. Pumice, stone? pumice stone. Yeah. Again, again, that's manufactured uh, to provide airspace. 
And in the finest texture, we call it perlite. So here's a little, um, these are all the same potting soil. So in a six inch pot, the same potting soil has got 20% air, 67% water capacity, 13% solid. Now as we drop to our smaller container sizes, go to a 648, that's 648 cells in an eight um, and a half, um, in a 11 and a half, 11, 20 tray, 10, 20 tray, 11 and a half by uh, 10 inches, you can see that that little bitty cell is almost all water and the solid is still 13%. So as your container size goes down, your airspace goes down as well. The other thing I see people doing is taking that pot of soil and just mashing the soil into the pot. When you compact that soil, you're also compacting airspace. So, um, for instance, one of the things that I uh, don't like to see in a greenhouse is um, where they take lots and lots of flats of soil and lots and lots of pots of soil and they stack them on top of each other because they're trying to get things done fast. But when you start stacking stuff, the stuff on the bottom gets more compact, the stuff on the top is less compact, and it drives the grower crazy because they've got different compaction, compaction levels, they've got different airspace levels, and they're going to require different watering regimes. So we need everything uniform. So what a lot of growers will do, especially if they're filling bulks of flats at a, at a long time, is each layer of flat they'll put on a pallet, they'll put a sheet of plastic in between the two, like an old piece of uh, polycarbonate or something like that, or some cardboard, just to keep things from um, compacting on top of each other. And you'll notice that a lot of our machines, when we see pot filling machines, which I'll show you in a minute, they, have a they will have a brush on them to put a uniform density of the potting soil. So pots, we typically want about 50% um, moisture in our potting soil, 50% holding capacity. And in potting in cells, cell packs, 67% uh, water holding capacity. And these are ideal units when we start looking at putting together potting mixes. Now over the years, I have done potting mix research probably since the mid-1980s. And frankly, I have grown plant materials successfully in just about anything you can imagine from shredded car tires all the way up to the finest peat moss that you can buy. And I can grow a plant in anything because I know the chemical qualities that I need. And one of those chemical qualities that you need is what we call cation exchange capacity. Now cation exchange capacity is roughly des uh, described as um, how many uh, negative charges that you have exposed to the environment, okay? In other words, you can latch onto a cation and then let it go later. And it attracts and holds those positive cations, positive ions, and we use the term CEC or milliequivalence, which is like a millimole value of that particular compound per 100 cc's or 100 cubic centimeters of potting soil. In Dr. Barberick's class, you talked about cation exchange capacity in 100 grams of soil. In potting soil, in organic potting soils, we use cubic centimeter. And your compounds like clays, your peat mosses, uh, core, which is uh, coconut fiber, they all have a high cation exchange capacity. So picture these little darker gray areas as your soil particle, your potting media particle, and they've got all these little exposed uh, negative ch binding sites, and your cations like calcium, potassium, hydrogen, magnesium, um, those are latched on and held in the potting soil by that for the plants. pH is also important, and the pH is, you've seen this before, it's the, um, 
concentration of the hydrogen ions, or actually it's the reciprocal of the concentration of hydrogen ions. And most plants, if there's potting soil, if there's not potting soil, if there's field soil blended in the in the pot, we use a pH of about 6.2 to 6.8. If it's completely soilless, in other words, there's no field soil, it's just peat moss, vermiculite, perlite, core, whatever, the ideal pH is 5.4 to 6. We drop it a little bit. Okay? And some of the components that we use will change the pH of our potting soil. And we need to be cognizant of that when we blend our soil. Why are, those Why are they different? Good question. Field soil is going to have a high concentrate, a high percentage of clay. It's going to increase the cation exchange capacity and uh, you're going to have some problems with availabil excessive availability of the nutrients or the cations that are coming with the field soil at the lower pH, and um, there's also a higher buffering capacity with that high cation exchange capacity that we need to have that higher pH value. So it, it's in relationship to the availability of nutrients. Okay? And of course, you need to know what you're putting in, and it's always easiest to adjust our pH of our potting soil when we're mixing it not after we've planted our plants in it, because most of the time we're using is dolomitic limestone or limestone, and that's a powder and it's hard to mix into the mix. So what's important when you're choosing your components, when you're choosing your constituents? Like I said, what you're actually using is not that important. It's what are the final properties of what you put together. So you need to know what you're blending. Like if you're using compost or garbage, if you're using composted uh, manures, if you're using pine bark, if you're using hardwood bark, if you're using peat moss, if you're using sphagnum peat moss versus hypnum peat moss, you need to know the pros and cons of each one as you're blending them. Okay. So some additional characteristics we need to think about. We know the four. The four characteristics are provide nutrient, a reservoir for nutrients, reservoir for water, airspace, and support. When you're looking at your constituents, it needs to not change in its characteristics over the period of time of production. If you're growing bedding plants, they're going to be on the bench four to six weeks. That's a pretty short time, and you're not going to worry too much about if it's going to change. But if you're growing a long-term crop that's going to be in the container six months, eight months, if it's in interior foliage plants, multiple years, you need to think about how it's going to change over that period of time. Good enough water holding capacity and air porosity is always important. We want to make sure it's not too heavy. We want to make sure that it doesn't have any hazardous substances. And I'm not talking about human hazards. I'm talking about hazards to the plant. We want to make sure that it's not too high in salts. Mushroom spawn, for instance, has got a lot of sodium. A lot of people think, well, I'll just go to the municipal golf course and I'll get composted grass clippings. Does that sound good? Actually, that's, that horrifies me because I no telling how many phenoxy herbicides they've sprayed on that material. So you need to know exactly where it's been. You need to know what the hazardous materials are. And you want to make sure it's free of pathogens, pests, <coughs> seeds, other plant propagules. If you're blending something up and it's got lots of uh, root pieces from uh, some farm, we don't want to have to be able to uh, be pulling morning glory out of our uh, potting soil all day long. So you need to think about the pathogens. Kind of a s snapshot, field soil. You can see it's got good water retention, nutrient retention. No air, it's heavy. Sphagnum peat moss, it's got good water retention, good nutrient retention. Sphagnum peat moss by itself has little air space and it's heavy. Composted pine bark, it, we usually grind it at what's called a 3 8 inch grind. It passes through a sieve, it's about 3 8 of an inch. And you can see it's got all the same characteristics. It's not until you get down into products like calcined clay Calcine clay um, 
is uh, the r raw form of kitty litter. If you've ever scooped a cat box, that's basically calcined play, clay with some um, chemicals in it to make it clump or some air fresheners to make it smell better than the, the cat urine. Vermiculite is also lightweight. Bark that's greater than 3 eighths of an inch up to 3 quarter. And then you can see that sand and you can blend all these products together to give you a good ideal mix. So let's talk a little bit about each product that we had on that graph. Field soil, back when we were doing cut flower production, and if you're doing organic vegetable production, you're going to probably want to use field soil. And of course, the best field soil there is is a structured loamy soil. A lot of people dig out what, what they have if it's not any good and replace it with a high quality agricultural loam soil. Good structure. Uh, a lot of people will take that loam soil and they'll actually raise, uh, cultivate their soil. They'll grow a green, green manure crop on it three or four years, something like alfalfa or Sudan grass or something like that, and then take the vegetation off and then grind it up, pasteurize it, and bring it in the greenhouse to give that good structure. And that's a really good organic production practice if you're an organic vegetable grower in the greenhouse. So we could use those green manure crops to uh, manage that, that field soil. However, a lot of people are not using, most people are not use, choosing to not use field soil anymore in their potting soils. Um, and it's not replaced on a regular basis. If we're growing a crop like roses, cut roses, on the West Coast, they still have a lot of cut rose production. Those plants are in those ground beds eight to 10 years, okay? So we need to make sure it doesn't change those eight to 10 years. So we're typically not doing that much. So the initial soil condition is very important. Short-term crops that are using potting soil, for instance, cut flowers, we want to be able to pasteurize it, like we saw over in the university greenhouse when they're pasteurizing those wheat beds. It's got to have good drainage, because we need to maintain air space pH, cation exchange, low soluble salts, all those things. Field soil in a container is a whole different character. Again, some growers will put in a little bit of a loam or a silt loam soil because it's got a, some clay, and that clay is going to give us increased cation exchange capacity. It's going to change our pH a little bit and it buffers those nutrient problems. We still have a handful of growers in Colorado that are still incorporating field soil into their potting mix. And their idea behind that is it gives them a little bit of a buffering capacity. They can do a little bit more extreme work with their fertilizers because they can have that uh, extra cushion. And they're doing that and they let them dry out a little bit more to increase the hardiness of their, of their transplants in fact, they have patented and trademarked this process and they call it a hardy plant or a hardy boy plant. Okay. So it increases their water capacity. So already you know that's Welby Gardens. If you're using potting soil in your mix, I mean field soil in your potting mix, you need to make sure that you can get the same potting, same field soil year after year after year that's consistent, that it's uniform and anymore, that's becoming harder and harder to find. But something I want to re you to remember, when you're shipping that soil, you're shipping real estate. Okay. By and far, most people are using a peat. And peats are classified into three major types of peat. We have moss peat, reed sedge peat and peat humus. And they're all described differently. And the common consumer doesn't know the difference between these. Now, the Federal Trade Commission requires that in order to be called peat, at least 75% of that material in that bag has to be a peat of some kind. The best peats that we can buy are 95 to 99%. And of course, when you increase that level, it becomes more and more expensive. Reed sedge peat is 85 to 95% typically. Okay, so a little bit on peats. Peat moss, or the peat uh, that we, sphagnum peat moss, is from the sphagnum plant, and the sphagnum moss in its raw form 
has the least amount of degradation. It's got a high water holder capacity, low pH, and it's going to take about 14 to 35 pounds of limestone per cubic yard to neutralize it to the pH that we want. Now, a lot of times we've worked with raw sphagnum moss as a packing material. Um, you probably use it in plant propagation class for air layering. Hypnum moss is a little, it's a different species. It's more degraded, five to seven times, and the pH is a little higher. Reed sedge peat is a blend of uh, water bog plants like, well, reeds and sedges. It's not, it's not a moss. They're actually full plants. Peat humus is the most highly degraded form. And the main difference is between heat, peat humus and the others is you really can't tell what the plant material was before. So the sphagnum moss industry, uh, the way it works, the sphagnum peat moss industry is the way it's harvested is a harvester go, first thing they do is they go into a bog and they drain it by digging a, a shallow ditch around the bog to drain the water out. And then they allow that to dry. It usually takes a year or two. Then they take these large harvesters, and this is a big four-wheel drive tractor, and basically just a giant vacuum cleaner, and they go and take a couple of inches of sphagnum mo peat moss off the top of that bog. They then process it, screen it, bale it, and ship it. And here's a picture of, um, this is a, a, a bog operation in uh, New Brunswick, Canada. Most of the sphagnum peat moss in the United States comes from Canada. And you can see that what the part of the, the land that they're harvesting or the, actually the water bogs that they're harvesting. Now, a lot of people are thinking about, OK, I'm going in there and destroying lakefront material, right? You're thinking about that, OK? One thing I want you to know is that peat lands are found everywhere in the world, except in the extreme desert or in the extreme Arctic. 80% of the peat lands in the United States are in Alaska. Michigan and Florida actually is two thirds of the peat that is harvested in the, in the continental United States, and that's all reed sedge peat. And in fact, what they're doing is they're going and digging up these ponds and these reed sedge bogs, digging it out, putting in a um, nice little lake and selling cabillion dollar homes around them. But Michigan, uh, good reed sedge Michigan peat, they're getting it out of lakefront material. Canada exports 80% of the peat that they're harvesting to the United States. 99% of what's harvested, 99% uh, of what's used in sphagnum moss is Canadian sphagnum moss. Now, um, global peat moss production <coughs> kind of peaked out in the late 1980s. Uh, because before the, end of before the end of the 1980s, almost all the peat moss in the world was being uh, harvested from Russia. And with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse, everything went, went uh, kind of down for them. So um, Canadian sphagnum peat moss, um, they're currently harvesting 272 million acres and it represents 25% of what's sold in the, in the world today. And 12% um, of Canada. So we're typically harvesting about 700,000, 800,000 metric tons of peat moss a year. And in Canada alone, through the natural process, because peat is an actively growing organism, a peat bog is a, is a biosphere. They're actually generating 50 million tons accumulate naturally. So we're, way, we're not taking anywhere near the amount of uh, peat that's being produced naturally. Now, a single bog, they typically harvest a, sing a single bog for about 15 to 50 years, depending on their permit. And it's a mining permit. A harvested bog can then regrow one foot of sphagnum moss in 10 to 15 years if we don't do anything to it. The Canadian Sphagnum Peat Moss Association requires their people to um, 
set, have set asides and reseed that bog with plant material so it can redevelop itself after they're done with it. So one of the things they do to re before harvesting is they re to reduce the impact on the environment. They do an environmental uh, check. They look at what's on the plant, get with the environmental groups, and look for bogs for reserves. Question. What's the reason behind a mining permit? Because it's considered a mine, mining process, it's a mining practice. So that's who's governing the controls, the governing body that controls it. During harvest, they try to minimize the acreage, leave buffer zones, and they never completely take all of the peat moss. And of course, they want to take the drainage water so it can be restored. After they're done with that bog, they restore it and they're also reclaiming that bog. So the ideal moss that we're working with it is the sphagnum moss species. To be called sphagnum peat moss, it's got to have at least two-thirds from the genus sphagnum. It's going to be a, peat of a pH of 3 to 4, and we're going to use limestone to bring the potting mix up. As we reduce the volume of sphagnum moss compared to perlite or vermiculite or something else, we reduce the need for uh, limestone. So there's a picture of a nice bog. There's a picture of the sphagnum moss plant. And the harvesters. And they're pretty big vacuum cleaners. One of the things that sets the prices of sphagnum peat moss is the harvesting season, because they can only harvest peat moss when the bog is dry and not frozen. So if we have a wet spring or a wet fall, a cold spring or a cold fall, what's going to happen is um, this, the harvesting season will be shorter, and as a consequence, the price goes up. And of course, the other thing that sets the price of fuel is the price of, price is the price of fuel. What does a, um, a bog also have to do to uh, be to be profitable for somebody to harvest it? They need to be able to get to the bog. Most of the bogs in the world are inaccessible by road. So, hypnum peat is from the hypnaceae family. 33% fiber, fiber content must be 50% genus. Um, pH is a little higher. And hypnum peat has a little more um, nitrogen in it. Reed sedge peat is uh, from reeds and sedges, Phragmites, Scirpus, Typa, uh, Carices, 33% fiber content, um, has to have more than 50% reed sedge and other moss fibers. One of the things about reed sedge peats is probably the least consistent of all the peats that you can buy. So you need to make sure you have an understanding. And uh, on Thursday, I'll show you a video about Colorado mountain peat, which is a reed sedge peat. Peat humus. This is what we're seeing from a lot of European areas. Advanced state of decomposition. You can't really tell what the plants are anymore. pH 5 to 7.5. You can see the pH is starting to come up with the decomposition level. It's got a pretty poor water holding capacity and a high bulk density, so it's not typically used. Across the um, Gulf states of the United States and also on the west coast and some in, in the central parts of the United States where we have a um, softwood bark from pines, firs, from lumber industry is commonly used um, as a potting media if it's not being used for fuel. Um, for softwood bark to work well, 
Uh, it needs to be free of wood. We don't want to have any um, free cellulose in the system. It's going to have a pH of about 3 to 4. In its uncomposted un form, it's going to have a low cation exchange capacity, but when we compost it for a year or so uh, in a processed pile, our cation exchange capacity goes up to 12. A lot of growers, nursery growers on this, in, um, in the southern United States are using composted pine bark so fast that they really don't have time to even compost. Uh, using it so fast, they're not even having time to compost it. So it's being used pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, for containers, we want 3 8 inch or less. Um, if we're going to blend it into our cut flower beds, a little bit bigger for that additional structure. Hardwood bark is completely different. It's lightweight, but it has to be composted. Hardwood bark that is not composted will act like raw sawdust in your potting soil. So it has to be composted, otherwise you're going to have a microorganism imbalance. Um, and typical grower that's composting hardwood bark, they're going to blend in some urea or some kind of uh, organic material. In fact, there's a processing plant outside of Platteville they have um, about uh, 500 houses of poultry, and they're generating over 500 tons of chicken manure a week. They're blending it with construction waste out of Denver, which is raw wood, and they have a state-of-the-art composting facility, and they're selling one of the best products, potting media products, that you can buy. It's called um, EKO is the brand, or if you buy it in the garden centers, it's called Nature's Yield. Excellent, excellent product. But, and it's using hardwood, shredded hardwood, and pine bark and such. It's got a higher cation exchange capacity than peat moss. Some species are going to be phytotoxic. Can you think of what species of, of uh, hardwood trees might be phytotoxic to plant growth? Walnut. Anything in the Juglandaceae family, correct. A walnut, pecans. Uh, butternuts. Another very interesting concept is after hardwood bark has been composted for a long time, it tends to be disease suppressive. And there's years of data supporting this showing that composted hardwood bark actually uh, reduces disease pressure. And it could be through a better balance and such as that. Pine bark should be composted, has to be milled and screened, requires some nitrogen. Uh, we talk about growth regulators later. You'll see that there's some interaction with growth regulators. Hardwood bark must be composted. Core. Core is, the is the, defined as the fibrous mesocarp from the inner seed of the coconut husk. And this is the, the core dust. There's long fibers, and the fibers are used in various parts of the world. Uh, that inner dusty part of the coconut. When you buy a coconut in the grocery store, it's got all the fuzziness on it. Okay, That's the fuzzy part on the outside of the coconut. That's the fibrous mesocarp. It is very similar in its characteristics to peat moss. In fact, if you let it dry excessively, it re-wets instantly, whereas if you use peat moss and you let it dry excessively, it shrinks away from the side of the pot and it's hard to re-wet without adding a surfactant, like a soap or something like that. So a lot of people will use core in their hanging baskets because it holds more water. And it requires a little more nitrogen. But core is its also considered, since it's an agricultural waste, a renewable product. So here's a uh, picture of a tomato crop with core. You can see it's a lot darker and so forth. Sawdust, we've talked about it before, it's got to be composted. Manures. And manures are an excellent source of organic material. But it must be fully composted in order for you to handle it, for it to be safe for the plants and safe for your handlers. It's got to be fully composted and properly composted. Most manures are high in, high in cation exchange capacity because it's got a lot of organic material. Um, cow manure from dairies have less weed risk. 
Any reason why that might be? Why would a dairy manure be better than a manure from another type of livestock producer? They feed their cows better, exactly. A better, higher quality feed. In fact, probably the worst is something like goats. Poultry manure have high ammonia concentrations. Why is that? Have you ever seen a chicken pee? Their, their urea disposal system is, is, is linked in with their fecal disposal system. And that's as close as I can get. I'm not an animal scientist. But they poop and pee at the same time. So you've got that urea is high, and so it has to be processed <coughs> or be too hot. And they're going to have lots of soluble salts, so they have to be pasteurized. And when you pasteurize that potting soil that's got any kind of manure in it, you're going to have an ammonia release, okay? And that's typically toxic to our plants. Uh, quick question, how do they pasteurize? Do they put it through a steamer of some sort, or? You know, if manures have been composted correctly, and they've done it a windrow, and they're managing it and keeping it moist, that natural heat, you get it up to 100, it's going to get 160, 170 degrees Fahrenheit on a regular basis. And as long as it's hot, it's going to be pasteurized. Now, when the, after the heat, after it gets done heating, and starts to cool down, when it starts to cool, that's when it's ready to use. So if somebody brings you a load of organic matter, and it comes off the truck, and it's steaming hot, that is too raw to use for plant growth. Okay? And if it smells, it's too raw for plant growth. Well, properly composted animal manures should not smell and should not be hot. Okay. Bagasse, uh, this is in your book. It's a byproduct of the sugar industry, high sugar content. Um, it's used a lot where they have um, sugar production, Hawaii, Florida, South Louisiana. Rice hulls. Oops. Uh, Question. Does bagasse come out of the canes or is it also beets? Mostly uh, it's either one, canes or beets. But most people take the, yes, the waste product. But most people take the waste beet pulp, where they have a high sugar beet production, and that's a pretty valuable livestock food, and they feed it to cattle. Um, in the areas where they have lots of um, sugar cane, they don't have as much cattle production as they do in places where they have sugar beet production. So, um, and the bagasse is not a good feed supplement like a sugar beet is. It is if you add a yeast to it. There's a special type of yeast you can mix in with it. And yeah, you have to. And it'll raise the yeah, you have to add. You have to add something to it. Yeah. Rice hulls, a byproduct of the rice milling industry. Um, most people think they've got to have white rice. In fact, that's the lowest quality rice there is and it's a sign of prestige in countries where they eat a lot of rice. But so we take the rice hull off, and that rice hull has, has got a high level of lignification, and it's got a little bit of silica in it. And it's a very good, lightweight um, product for pot putting into your uh, potting soil. A lot of the potting soils that are manufactured out of central Arkansas and shipped all over the United States have rice hulls in it. And it's a good at improving drainage. And in fact, a lot of the regions where we have rice production, they'll use rice hulls in the, manu in the uh, construction of a golf green. It has good penetration. Got lots of silica, so it doesn't uh, degrade very quickly. Nitrogen depletion is not much of an issue. It's better to be used after it's aged a little bit. Most people are not really composting rice hulls. It really doesn't compost. It's more of an aging. What a rice farmer will do is just um, take their rice hulls, dump it in a pit, let it sit there for a year or two, then dig it out with a front end loader and sell it. So that's typically what they do. Rice hulls are a very good product. Calcined clay is kitty litter, basically. It's a Montmorillonite clay, which is a double lattice clay that's got a high cation exchange capacity, um, 3.4 to 11.8. It doesn't really affect the pH when we blend it. It does increase the bulk density. And in fact, most people keep um, calcined clay on hand in their greenhouses more for chemical spills. Okay, sand. 
sand quality varies from region to region. It base, it's varies based on the base on the the base parent material where the quarry is digging it. A lot of times too, if you're buying a concrete grade sand that hasn't been washed, you want to use concrete grade because it's been washed. It's got a lot of silt in it, and a lot of that silt has a tendency to have salts and uh, other compounds in it. So you, we don't we want to use make sure it's washed, and you want to make sure that you if you're buying sand that you're not buying sand from DOT Department of Transportation because they use sand every year. In fact, all along I-70 up in the mountains, they have bunkers that collect the sand off the interstates so they can reuse it the next year. Sometimes they'll sell their excess and it's got lots of road salt and it's not good for plant production. But the only reason we use sand in our potting mix is to increase our bulk density if we're growing tall plants like palms or something like that so they don't tip over as much. Vermiculite. Vermiculite is basically a mineral similar to mica. And uh, you've all hiked up in the foothills and you've seen outcrops of mica, I presume. And it's a flaky mineral. Okay. In fact, um, they used to use mica to uh, sheets of mica for windows. And some of your old pot-bellied stoves that have a kind of a flimsy film on it, that's probably mica because it's very fire resistant. So we heat this ore, this mica light ore, and to 745 degrees C, and it pops like popcorn because it's got water in it. And that, when that pops up, it gives us the um, accordion-like structure, and it's basically chemically inert. It's fire-resistant, odorless. It's got a since it's a malt, 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 since it's a clay structure. Mica is a clay structure. It gives us some good water holding capacity, good aeration, cation exchange capacity. It's going to have a little bit of a mineral charge to it, so it's going to give us a little boost of fertility. But over time, and like in a, if you were putting it in a uh, foliage plant, potting soil, it's going to compact over, over time as it ages, so it's not that long term. So if you've got a potting mix that's eight months or older, you're probably not going to want to use it. And here's a picture of some popped vermiculite materials. Now, vermiculite comes from its its mined product. Question? Um, you were saying that vermiculite doesn't last very long. Uh, does perlite last longer? I know vermiculite. Um, perlite will last longer if it's not handled. Vermiculite, it just has a tendency to compact over time. And we're talking a year or more. Now, vermiculite is, comes from mines like South Africa, China, Brazil, Zimbabwe. And the largest uh, vermiculite mines today are uh, in South Africa. We typically don't use South African vermiculite for, pot, for horticulture because the pH is too high because of that mineral processing. Um, some comes from China. Most of the Vermiculite that's sold in the United States comes from Virginia and South Carolina. Now you may have heard about vermiculite and its relationship with asbestos. And um, there's a mine in Libby, Montana that was contaminated with uh, diopside. And they harvested vermiculite out of that mine for decades. And diopside is closely related to asbestos. In other words, there was a lot of asbestos in that material as well. Now, asbestos doesn't necessarily come with vermiculite. It just is, comes with some vermiculite. And most of the ore bodies that we're harvesting today do not contain asbestos. So if you've got consumers or employees that are worried about asbestosis from vermiculite, you need to know that it's not that much of an issue anymore. Uh, that big mine in Libby, Montana has long been closed. And in fact, I think I've got a YouTube video on your uh, potting soil uh, page about asbestosis and mesothelioma and relationship with vermiculite. But if you're, so the modern vermiculite products, there's not a risk and um, it's going to present a risk where if you're exposed to the dust over a long period, you could have a, a problem. 
The EPA recommendations is to make sure you use it in an outdoor well ventilated area, keep it, keep it vermiculite damp, and in fact what we do, the most important thing we do when we're using vermiculite and we're starting to use it in a mix, is we need to wet it. You know, the, they spray it with water so it keeps the dust down. Um, we're not worried about asbestosis, but it just makes it a much more wholesome environment to work. Perlite is another material that we use on a regular basis. It's actually a silicous rock. It's volcanic in nature, and it's from pumice. And when it's take that um, material and we heat it, it uh, explodes just like popcorn, and we get the little puffy crude rock. We're heating it up to about 871 degrees C. It pops with the water vaporizing, and it's very lightweight, and it's physically and chemically inert. In other words, it has no, has a, a neutral pH, and does not provide any cation exchange capacity, doesn't provide any nutrients. It's basically sterile. Vermiculite is sterile too until we open the bag. Once you open any of these bags, they're no longer sterile. And it provides it lightens our potting soil, it's sterile, and gives us good aeration. Some publications you'll see say that there's some relationship of fluoride toxicity in your vermiculite. Uh, early editions of Dr. Nelson's book, he talks about avoiding fluoride, avoiding perlite for fluoride uh, toxicity. That's since been shown that it's not necessarily true. Fluoride toxicity is prime. We, when we do see it, we see it in lanceolate leaved plants. The most common one is a spider plant. How many people have ever grown a spider plant? Everybody's grown a spider plant. And you get the little leaf tip burn. That's typically a salt accumulation or fluoride or something like that. It has been thought that perlite contributes to that. Uh, whether or not that's exactly true, there are some readers that some writers and researchers that say yes, it's true and some writers and research say it's not true. So here we have a picture of vermiculite on the left, perlite in the middle, and peat moss. Actually, this is calcined clay. No. Vermiculite on the left, perlite in the middle, and sand on the right. Some growers have tried to use polystyrene foam. To date, there's no recycle capacity for styrofoam. So at one point, we tried grinding it up into beads or little chunks and putting it in our potting mix. Very lightweight, no water holding capacity, no CEC. It's a waste product, so you'd think it would be a good idea. Problem is, it all migrates to the top. It flows to the top, even in a, potting, in a pot. And by the time you're done with your crop, it's blowing everywhere, and it makes a mess. Rock wool. Rock wool is slightly alkaline. It's a spun mineral product. It's a fiber. Not much cation exchange capacity. It's got a lot of water holding capacity. This is primarily used as a substrate for hydroponics. It um, has a large water reserve, doesn't shrink. It's got good air water balance and it's easy to irrigate without overwatering. You can just push water to it. And that's why the hydroponic growers use it a lot because it's good in a recirculating system. And here you can see this is a rock wool slab and you can see how happy and bright the roots are. Question? What rock is the wool spun from? What rock is the wool spun from? I was afraid you were going to ask that question. I don't remember. It's from a volcanic rock. And it's natural, and roots grow easy into the rock wool. So what's the best thing to do? Do you formulate your own mix, or do you buy a mix? Well, if you're mixing your own, you've got to have the capital investment cost. You have to have the, get the storage materials and such as that. But you have the uniformity, and you have the quality control. Typically, if you're mixing your own, like up to about six cubic feet, you can do that on hand with a shovel. 
Uh, 10 cubic feet, you're probably going to use a bucket tractor or a tractor or a cement. Some people will use a cement truck that's no longer roadworthy. Use that as a mixer. Um, large scale mixing, we use storage bins, hoppers, conveyor lines, bulk mixers, inline equipment, such as that. So here's a, a graphic of maybe an inline mixing line where we've got the sphagnum moss to the left and that hopper loads it on, lowers it onto, drops it onto a conveyor, the conveyor moves along, the perlite drops onto the conveyor, moves along, the vermiculite, our potting soil and our, potting, our chemicals and limestone and fertilizer will blend in, such as that. 